Hey, all you holistic hipsters out there, it's that time. So grab your chalice of choice and sit back and sip along with us. We would love to welcome you to the Tea Podcast, where we spill the tea on all things holistic in the pet grooming industry. Let me introduce you to our hostesses with the mostesses. She is the socialite of skin and coat care, Ms. Michelle Knowles. And the queen bee of all things oily, Ms. Melissa Conti Diener. Brought to you by TheOilyGroomer.com. Are you searching searching for a new new and more mindful way of grooming? Interested in understanding how to grow your grooming business with a more holistic and organic approach? Please contact Melissa Cuffy Diener at TheOilyGroomer.com so that you can set up a meeting and bring balance and prosperity to your life. And AllThingsPaw.com. Intermediate, Intermediate and advanced, advanced courses, courses in pet esthetician work, work, fear recovery, fear recovery animal, animal handling, and more. more. Get your learn on with all, all things fall. fall. Also, new classes with Melissa include intuitive energy work, transitional therapy, and compassionate touchpoint therapy for the pet pro. Also, the Herbal Paw Apothecary phone consultations, history gathering, vet diagnosis recommended, we custom formulate pet skincare regimens. Now, let's get this tea party started. Alrighty then. Hey! This is our little lead-in oh, music little here for the for the holiday mm-hmm. makes me think of tip toe mm-hmm. <laughs> melissa michelle how are you doing today i woke up on the right side of the dirt so i think that that's a good day i think so as well how are you doing today i am doing very well thank you you're very welcome <laughs> You're like the two geese in the uh, aristocrats. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indubitably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indubitably. So what do you have in your cup today? Oh, my cup is, uh, it's a favorite cup here, if you could see. Oh, that's it is, very nice. It it's got skeletons, skeletons doing, doing yoga poses. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> And it actually says Namaste on the inside. I love that. I have in here some, uh, I'm a favorite uh, purchaser of uh, Celestial Seasonings teas. I like them. And this is Bengal Spice. Oh, very nice. Very cinnamony, uh, citrusy uh gingery very zippy and but very warming i'm liking that a lot i like yeah, it a lot. that's a favorite of mine on top of the fact that it has a tiger on it i'm always like i'm very much always drawn to uh to lions and tigers oh very nice you're because you're a cat person i uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> considered that you got the disease to make you less afraid of cats yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So what's Perfect. in your cup, Michelle? So interestingly enough, this is one of my favorite mugs um, because it's little. It's oh, it tiny. Little mug. And it's got glossy stripes on the bottom and it's matte black. And I love a good neutral. I- I'm just, they make me happy for some reason. It's very nice. And it's a tad bit bigger than, say, an espresso cup. It, yeah, it's, well, it's pretty tiny. It's, it's, it's a it's a baby. <laughs> yeah, mug. it is a baby mug. It is. It's for tea, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and inside, I'm still going with the blood theme. Uh, okay. So we're still doing olive leaf. We're doing linden, nettle, and ashwagandha. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's what's in my cup today. Very nice. I'm. 
So I bet you're wondering what our topic is for today. Yeah, I would love to know. Bam! Herbology and folklore. And folklore! Do they even work? Like, were they barking up the wrong tree? Or are they still viable today? That's what we're talking about today. Uh, I think so. I think that um, a lot of the medicines that we have today have uh, roots in uh, folklore medicine, folklore remedies. Absolutely. I think so, too. Here, let's wind that down. All right. Um, yeah, uh, herbology and med medicinal folklore have been happening, I think, since somebody plucked a leaf and ate it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we, and especially Actually, in all over the world, there are communities who have their own set of herbs because they're local. And a nutritionist I was talking to one time said, honestly, wherever you're born, that's probably where you want to derive your herbal medicine from right uh because where you're born at rather than astrology which we're not going to get into that today but rather than astrology where you're born all the microbes that you consume the dirt that touches you the air that you breathe of your locality actually is what builds your immune system in that area we're very global now and we travel around to all kinds of different cities countries all over the world um and without a thought of how that new area is going to affect us. The dirt, the microbes, the smells, the all the things that you touch in this new area have new stressors for your, for your immune system. Uh, so well, I think that's I, why they, they, they tell you to utilize local honey for yes. your allergies so that um, if you have allergies for your region of the country where you live, utilize uh, local honey because those pollinators, those bees took that pollen from those plants that you're more likely to have an allergic reaction to. And thus the thought process is that you will build up an immunity to them by ingesting them a smaller, you know, smaller part. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Basically. And again, that's, that's folklore. That's mm -hmm. folklore medicine right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that is absolutely folklore medicine, and there's scientific backing for that. Right. Um, for that finding, it's interesting because herbs are mentioned in Genesis, in the first yeah. chapter of the Bible, and throughout its text. As civilizations developed, so did the knowledge for the use of herbs. In India, Ayurveda medicine has used many herbs, such as turmeric, possibly as early as 4,000 BC. In Mesopotamia, the written study of herbs dates back over 5,000 years to the Sumerians, who created clay tablets with lists of hundreds of medicinal plants. Egyptian schools of herbalists have existed since 3,000 BC. How yeah, crazy is that? That's incredible. And, and the way that they used the Egyptians were pretty, uh, pretty incredible people. And for those that like that don't know that uh, like not all of their rulers were actually Egyptian. Like Cleopatra was of Greek descent. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, she Olga, was not, she was not dark skinned. <laughs> no, was, uh, from the Ptolemaic, I think it was uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. dynasty. Right. Um, and she was an amazing linguist, but she also was an herbalist mm -hmm. and would create beauty creams and, and medicinal or, you know, um, cosmetics, perfumes, yeah, perfumes, uh, um, I can't think of what it's called. Contraceptives. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> for, for that time, Egyptian contraceptives are alligator feces mixed with a urine. Yeah. So, and then they would put that inside of them. Inside, so, yeah. Yeah. But, we're going to, you know, they weren't all good, but we're, no. here, we're here to suss out what still works, what was right. good, what was but true, I, I, and I mean, what was just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm just saying that they were, they were pretty, uh, pretty ahead of their time, especially with their embalming and, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and I just they used herbs to preserve the dead as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
I just read an article about how some of the jars that they would seal and put with the mummified bodies, uh, some of them were filled with perfumes, frankincense mm -hmm. and myrrh, mm -hmm. and, um, and some of them uh, had not been discovered until the archaeological dig site people jump you know down in there and start opening and taking all these things out and they had been sealed for hundreds of thousands of years and they still held scent right it's just crazy and how they would they would pack these herbs and um and uh since i'm aromatherapist that really intrigued me that they actually had aromatherapy uh blends in there as well um, to send with them on the river six, you know, so that they could have those in the other, uh, the afterlife. Um, and they would use, uh, alabaster and jade and, uh, quartz, different color quartzes and, mm -hmm. uh, things to fashion these gorgeous vessels to hold these precious herbs and, and, mm -hmm. uh, aromatics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people don't understand because you've got a, pe a salt and pepper shaker on your table, how precious those spices actually are. Right. How precious. There used to be none on anybody's table anywhere mm -hmm. unless you had local access to salt. Uh, pepper itself was so expensive, it was worth more than gold. Right. So just having, I'm going to say, under an ounce of pepper, only a, a pharaoh or a king uh, could afford something like that. Uh, you know, if you were in the elite, you know, governing class, normal folk didn't do that. We had to rely on whatever we could grow in our garden. So I think that's pretty interesting as well. Um, medicine's come a long way. And I think this is appropriate for our particular podcast and how it intertwines with the grooming industry is that we talk about ingredients all the time. Mm -hmm. We talk about formulation, ingredients, what they do, how they do it. Uh, you know, it's it's a uh, we are still actively discussing ingredients, formulations, decks, on and on in our industry. And so, I think it's important to learn how it all started. I mean, pharmacology, pharmaceuticals came directly from herbal knowledge. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, especially if you do supplements, I guess the FDA comes and visits you before you open shop and lets you know that herbs are medicine that they are choosing not to regulate yet. So it's something very interesting. They're, the herbs uh, that we use medicinally today are the same ones that we used many, many moons ago, uh, with the exception of some of them that we found aren't effective for that particular thing or just down out nasty and no one's going to do that. Like alligator, alligator feces <laughs> and urine. <laughs> and urine. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's just say this: if 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 your is full of alligator feces and urine, I don't think the opposite sex is going to want to impregnate you. If that's what's in there, you know. Like I wish. I wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> We know how some, 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 some men can work around it. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my God, that's so true. Oh, oh <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. So I have pulled up a, an old uh, historical sor herbal sorcery and lore. So I'm just going to go through a couple of them that I think are really interesting. Um, Go ahead. Um, Shoot. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, let's see. Devil's bit. Dill. Dill was known as an anti-witch plant. It was used to lull people into stupors, and thus mothers used it on their babies to keep them sleepy. It's also used in spells in witchcraft. Eyebright. Dill, Dill yeah. Um, let's see. And then I go over here to my to my thing. And then we're going to read a modern version of what dill is used for. And I think that is going to be really interesting. Let's see. Dill. Do tell. I know, right? <laughs> 
I'm waiting here with bated breath. I want to know. Besides pickles. Pickling. <laughs> I so, love the smell of fresh dill. I love dill potato salad. Yeah. I love it. I drives love me. It. I love it. So dill is an herb that's found throughout European and Asian cuisine. So it's it was came from that area, I guess. <clears throat> and not only is it used culinarily, it is also very nutritious. Uh, it's got vitamin C, 8% of the daily value, manganese, 5%, vitamin A, 4%, folate, 3%, iron, 3%. So dill is also a good source of manganese. Manganese is essential. Manganese uh, helps regulate like over 600 time. processes in the body. We need manganese uh, a lot and magnesium. We need to say manganese. Just say manganese. It's fun to say. <laughs> it, it kind of is, yeah. It supports normal functioning of your brain, nervous system, oh, and metabolism. I need manganese. <laughs> yes. So the potential benefits with its name derived from the Old Norse word dilla, which means to soothe, dill has been used since ancient times to treat colic in infants and digestive yeah. diseases, as well as to help with breastfeeding. Another one that's good for uh, breastfeeding and colic in your babies is if the mother ingests catnip. Yes. Catnip will keep the baby from developing colic, which is bubbles in the digestive tract. Let's see what these more traditional uses have not been supported by research. Dill has been shown to have other potential health benefits. Uh, it's rich in antioxidants. It benefits heart health. Uh, it helps lower blood sugar levels. It may have anti-cancer properties and other potential benefits that they're still studying is antibacterial properties, bone health and menstrual cramps. So that's just one herb that we randomly pulled off of a page. You know, uh, and all of them, uh, now that pharmaceuticals, which really were only developed at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, our pharmacy, pharmacology in itself, pharmaceuticals, as we know it today, are very young, very young. However, herbology itself is over 5,000 years old. So they've taken good, wholesome, natural medicine uh, plants that you grow in your backyard um, or that you find wild crafting and they've taken some pieces out of them and concentrated them and put them in a pill and charge you a bunch of money for them and put a patent on them. Uh, and that's basically pharmacology. Am I wrong? Oh, absolutely. You're, you're 100% correct. In yeah. That, in so that. we're coming full circle, I think as practitioners and people who want a, a healthier alternative for their animals and for them, their families, um, we're coming to see the benefits of herbology. And I think that's a lot of reason why we got into, you got into oils. I got into herbs, you know, and formulation itself. You know, we want to yeah. get away from all those mindless chemicals uh, that don't agree with our systems, that don't right. agree with our body systems. So. I think that, um, I think that most of us grew up with some sort of, of, folkloric, you know, medicinal uses, like you had a grandmother or a mother or an aunt or someone that would be like, oh, here, do this. And, you know, um, it wasn't a traditional medicine to take. Mm -hmm. um, I know for babies, we would rub whiskey on their gums mm -hmm. um, when they were teething. Um, uh we would use uh, syrup um, with a mixture of uh, like caro syrup and a mixture of chamomile mm -hmm. um, and usually parsley. Um, it just depended for a colicky baby mm -hmm. um, and give them that. The caro syrup is going to grease up the works, you know, if, mm -hmm. if they are having trouble going to the bathroom. Um, the parsley is an anti-inflammatory. It's also an anti-flagellation uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> medication, parsley. Um, so it'll help with uh, gas bubbles and that kind of stuff. The chamomile is very soothing, again, for the digestive tract. So those were easy ones that um, just, you know, come to the forefront of my brain that with, you know, with kids. 
Mm -hmm. um, oh, I've heard all kinds of weird stuff. They used to take a slice of onion and, and put them in your, put them on your, the bottom of your feet and put your sock on and sock sleep on. with it yep. to detox. Yeah. Also, um, yeah, yeah. So a lot of different things uh, have been happening. We will not get to them all for sure. No. One but of I my favorites was you used to take a potato if you had a wart like on your oh, hand yeah. or somewhere and take a potato, cut it in half, rub it on the wart and bury the potato in the garden. Because mm -hmm, that and, does a lot. Yeah. And your wart's supposed to disappear, but it's actually the potatoes have salactic acid in them. And so that's actually what's making the wart go away, not the burying, you know, the, the, the burying it in the garden for it mm -hmm. to, you know, do well, depending on what kind of wart you have. Right. The warts actually have a little seed in them that grows the fungus that creates the wart. Right. So if you can peel away the layers of wart and get down to that seed and dig it out, then your wart will also go away. So, but those are, you know, those are folklore and they're, mm -hmm. they're rooted in actual medicinal, or I should say actual medicinal uh, cures or, mm -hmm. um, although there's not a lot of cures, they're usually something that helps take care of the symptoms. We well, yeah, yeah, there are cures. However, uh, if you are not um, a pad carrying doctor of some sort, uh, right. you can't say the word cure. Right. That's been taken away from us. Uh, we can support. We can support the immune system. We can support the blood. We can support the lungs. We can support all those things. We are not capable of curing anything. And in my mind, uh, you can't cure someone else. They can only cure themselves. Right. You can support them. <coughs> Mm. But, I wish you would make some onion syrup. <laughs> make some onion syrup, uh huh. Onion and honey. Yeah. But yeah. Um, here, I'm gonna take it. Right. There you go. It's really vodka in there. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Made from pure potatoes in her backyard. <laughs> yes. yes. Fermented. It's great. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I wanted to, um, animals in history also, with no prompting uh, from people whatsoever, will self medicate with herbs. I think that is so That's, awesome. What is Anybody, that called? Isn't it, isn't it called zoo pharmacology? Yes. Uh, anybody who has horses or animals right. or dogs uh, or has worked in the zoo will understand this uh, completely. Um, just here's an article from The Economist with just a little snippet. Chimpanzees suffer uh, suffering from intestinal worms in Tanzania dose themselves with the pith of a plant called Veronia. This plant produces poisonous chemicals called terpenes. Its pith contains a strong enough concentration to kill gut parasites, but not so strong as to kill chimps, nor people for that matter. What's interesting is that the chimpanzees don't live in the place where the herb is. They have to try have to leave their territory and go to this special place where this plant grows, which tells me that huge portions of the ancestry of chimpanzees right. and us knew about that, somehow learned it from somewhere, yep. and now have passed it down genetically throughout you know, their progeny. I think that's so interesting. Even my own dogs, when I dump my herbal remnants, when I'm done filtering them and stuff, I'll just dump them in the garden and they go in a big compost pile. Uh, they love to snuffle the compost pile. And I've seen them eat particular herbs. Like, oh, this is delicious. When right. they see me getting the herbs out and I'm measuring stuff out, they're all around me. Like I'm going to give them a treat. It's crazy. And I'm like, none of this is for you. But they do get <laughs> herbs. They do get herbs at mealtime. So they do get herbs, especially the older ones get um, uh, blood, uh, blood support and heart support, especially Bunny, who is in her later years uh, and does have congestive issues. So she does get some herbs. And then I just give some nutritive herbs to the other two. So I just think that's really interesting. Elephants well, I think, do it. I was uh, going to say, I think it, it comes from the from all the way from the animals that are not generalized, uh, generally domesticated, 
yeah. all the way down to domesticated animals. Our pets will go out and actually eat grass in the mm -hmm. yard or look for those kind of things. And then they'll vomit. And you'll be like, mm -hmm. why are they eating grass? Well, because they probably have an upset stomach. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to regurgitate mm -hmm. whatever it is. Or mm -hmm. sometimes the De dependent upon the types of grass, it will actually help settle their stomach as well. Mm. What I think interesting about the canid is that they've developed a mechanism, uh, their body has developed a mechanism that if they do eat something poisonous, they immediately get diarrhea and they throw up. Right. Uh, and that may be because they've ingested something to help them do that because they're uh, their digestive tract is like a straight shot. It's, it's small compared to ours because they're developing that meat. You know, they're processing that meat and we've got to process uh, vegetation. So we have and a they longer also process the, the energy that they get from eating that primarily a meat based diet. So mm -hmm. it's a, they don't need that long intestinal tract for mm -hmm. all that. They, their body yeah, well, the, stores up that energy like a battery, basically. So they well, the, the, the vegetation that they eat comes from the intestines that are from right. the kill that are already fermented. So exactly. they're very easy to digest. They can get all the nutrients out of that. Uh, and then they... And uh, the fermentation helps their gut as well. Yes. But I thought that was really interesting. If they do feel sick, that's why they get diarrhea and vomit really quickly. Because they're made like that. Because they're eating roadkill in nature. They would be yeah. eating roadkill and all kinds of weird stuff. And not all of it's going to agree with them. So they can throw it up really quickly before they have to ingest more of the substance. So well, that was primarily they're scavengers. Yes. So they'll, they'll eat whatever they can find that is going to provide them with some way to get energy to move on to the next spot. What I think I've been contemplating here, uh, an idea came to me a while ago, and it's a belief that I hold to be true, but you can never, you can never know. Something happened when we met dogs and we domesticated them or they domesticated us uh, is becoming more and more apparent. They domesticated us. Um, what happened? What was the need for the dog that was so important? that we needed them. Uh, and that's another reason why people think that cats can go between dimensions as well. We befriended cats um, because I believe maybe there was something that was there at the time that's not there now, that we needed their sharp hearing and their sharp senses to sense that we couldn't. Well, we know that overall, both species, cats and dogs, were brought in to help uh, uh, keep the rodent population away from our food, you know, and to keep our, our food stores safe. Mm -hmm. So we know that they came in as scavengers around the, the, uh, hunting and, and campsites and villages where they would be, you know, dispersing the meat, breaking it down. What do they call that? Processing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, so the animals came in, the dogs came in and they ingratiated themselves into our, you know, into our space. And they I would. Think we needed them for more than just scavenging, though. No, no. Um, I mean that they they would be protective of us. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with the cats. I know the cats were huge in keeping the um, the rodent population down from our grain stores. Mm hmm. But I mean, even before that, when we first met dog, when we were wearing rags and whatnot. Oh, you know, wow. that's what I'm talking about. Something happened. That was like a couple weeks before my time. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we're just talking to hear ourselves talk right now. Yeah. Anyway, this is just, we say what we want because we can. <laughs> but I just, I often contemplate that there may have been a time when there were other animals other dangers, other right. things, uh, without being too specific and getting going off on a, a huge tangent. Uh, but I, I, I often think that there was something that mutually benefited us to band together, to go against or to be protected from this whatever, whatever. You know, no one will ever know what life 50,000 years ago looked like for, you know, our forebears and for the forebears of our pets. Um 
but I can't, uh, when you look at nature, like, let's just say that there is a pariah living off of, you know, human waste and, you know, our throwaways and our trash or whatever in nature. When you see that everybody gathers for the feast, but then they go back home. They don't sit around the campfire and share right. stories. So I think it's interesting. There probably was uh, quite a few factors in that, that some of them will never be aware of. You know, I, I talk to Jennifer Bishop Jenkins like about this stuff all the time. You know, I think it's really interesting. And she's like, well, there's no evidence. I'm like, well, there's no evidence of a lot of things that we believe. Right. Here we are. <laughs> I think it's fanciful to think that. And I just, that's what I intuitively feel, whether it's right or wrong or true or not. There's, there's no scientific basis for it. But I just think that there was probably something that made it better to be together than apart. All right. Rather than just the food. You know, no, I think that the food is probably what drew them. Mm -hmm. But after that, it was, uh, I mean, I think about it every night. I mean, I literally, I live with a bunch of dogs mm -hmm. and while I don't live with a pack of, of large breed dogs, I have primarily little small dogs, but I think about it every night when I'm laying in bed and they inevitably have to lay on top of me and lay on like they do with themselves, you know, that mm -hmm. they pile and they sleep all around and on top of you. And, and I think to myself, even though they're small, they could hurt me if they really wanted to. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Especially yeah. if they're going up on you. Yeah. You know, you be over. <laughs> right. You know, and, and it's like, Honestly, what is it about us that they that they cling to, mm -hmm. that they stop that stops them from instinctually wanting to harm us because mm -hmm. they certainly could, um, and and actually want to bond with us and because we have clearly defined roles within a pack of dogs, mm -hmm. um, and as a as a human. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know they don't look at me as another dog. So, mm -hmm. um, but they do look at me as a leader, like somebody that they are like, um, look for cues from me, like mm -hmm. how they're supposed to react and all that. So mm -hmm. I think that somewhere, somehow, um, I, my, again, no scientific evidence. It's just my personal belief. Mm -hmm. I believe that they, I believe they were created to, um, be guardians for us to be, you know, here for us, um, mm -hmm. in many different ways. So, um, but again, I, I particularly care for folklore. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I've, I used to study, um, fairy tales and myths, yeah. and legends. Uh, I've taken college courses on it. Uh, it fascinates me because it's part of our history. And not that everything in a fairy tale is true. However, if you look at the fairy tales of every culture, like uh, Baba right. Yaga or the Norwegian West of the Sun, East of the Moon, um, you see a detailed study, if you will, of the, the culture at that time. Yes. How, they, how their mind worked, what they prioritized in their lives. Uh, I think that there is a lot of truth in those stories because they come from those places. Um, and every place has those stories. And I, I just, I'm thrilled. And they're, usually, they're usually peppered, pun intended, mm -hmm. um, with a tie to some form of herbal folklore, mm -hmm. um, nature. There's a witch. Right. <laughs> there's a potion. Right. There is a, you know, some, there's, there's, there's a parable of a, of a, a, a king that had daughters. And he got, he buried them all off and they were the apple of his eye and he loved each one of them dearly. And then his youngest daughter, who was his favorite, favorite, right? Uh, according to the, to the story, he married her off. And then the first visit that he and his queen had to her new place, she told him, oh, during her wedding, I'm a terrible storyteller. At her wedding, her father said, do you love me? And she goes, you are the salt in my food. And he got very upset and offended by what she said. And they didn't speak. And she went to her new household. And then finally the king broke down and says, I'm going to go visit my daughter, blah, blah, blah. He came 
and sat down and all of his food didn't have any spices in it. No salt, no pepper, no nothing. Uh, and he was like, this food's terrible. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Blah, blah. And as he was becoming more and more dissatisfied, she put her utensils down and said, see, without you, there's nothing. Your, the life in the world is bland and this and that and the other and blah, blah, blah. You are the salt in my food. That's how I feel about you, Father. I love you very much. And then he understood what she was trying to tell him. So that was even a parable around a spice, right. <laughs> around yeah. a mineral, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if you really look for it, we are so entwined with plants uh, and nature. And uh, it amazes me that how many city folk that live in big cities or whatever are so separated from the earth. They're so separated from their dogs how dogs act, what they need out of life. You know, you're an apartment dweller and here you're teaching your dog all these weird things. And he's like, okay, but doesn't see the reason for it, but he'll do it because he loves you. Uh, we're so separated from earth. We're so separated from the, the things that make us thrive. Fresh air, fresh right. green, you know, healthy environment, the whole nine yards, knowledge of, of what's going on with our own bodies. We just, we're so separated. Well, I think that we, um, I think we get to a certain age and for most of us, we, um, we want to, we want to believe in those kind of stories and those kind of, you know, that folklore and we want to believe that, but community tells us it's time to grow up and to become skeptical and to separate yourself from those kind of things. And so that pulls us further away from mm -hmm. the roots of what that, that, that story may not be true. You know, it may not be historically accurate, mm -hmm. but it serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we understand that like the, the parable you just told that salt, not only flavors the food that we eat that it's it's a precious resource in itself mm -hmm. on top of the fact that we refer to people as salt salt of the earth i just said this the other day mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of my students was like um <clears throat> asking about the trach saver which all for groomers had uh uh i had purchased some for my class so that they could see how to use those and I said, oh, just go to the website and order them. The people that own the company are so sweet. They are just salt of the earth people, mm -hmm. meaning that they're just precious in mm -hmm. who they are, you know, and I don't think a lot of people correlate those things anymore. Mm -hmm. Another one is, are you worth your salt? Yes. Yeah. Are you we, worth your salt? We as humans and organic beings that are sentient and moving around, we are, uh, the basis of us is carbon and salt. Right. Um, salt provides uh, the saline solution in our blood to, in order to carry electricity around. We have to have salt or we're, we're a battery is basically right. what we are. So yeah, there are parables around salt. There's parables around herbs, potions, um, not taking poisons. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there's so much. Uh, I think it's interesting that the veterinary medicine in and of itself simply was born out of the husbandry of animals. Yeah. Um, there used to be not be veterinarians. And when veterinarians first said, oh, I'm a veterinarian, I'm an animal doctor. People laughed at them like they laughed at groomers in 1980. Uh, they just they're very recently uh, born into the modern era of being uh, respected as doctors which I think is very interesting. Um, uh, and now they've been Westernized. So yeah. now they're all about pharmacology instead of, you know, that cow probably just needs some sorrel, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Uh, that's basically what they did. And they were very successful or we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, I, I, think I remember gotten... as a kid, um, we lived next to one of the multiple homes that we lived in. Uh, in upstate Pennsylvania, there was, uh, we lived in a town called Quaker Town, Pennsylvania. So mm -hmm. pretty much Quaker people lived there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were next to a, uh, a farm that had a cow and my parents got me a small cow, uh, a calf, um, 
because I always wanted a cow. <laughs> and so I had this cow and it was constipated and the farmer from next door, Quaker people are very, in my experience, they were very, very nice people, very community oriented. And he came over and he fed my cow a Hershey bar. And my cow was no longer constipated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's got to be folklore medicine. You know, why would you give a cow a milk chocolate? Because it, it actually gets things moving for a cow. <laughs> you know, so it's like there are, there are communities of people that function with folklore. Mm -hmm. um, your Mennonites, uh, the Quakers. Mm -hmm. the yeah, Amish. they're still practicing all those herbal medicines. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's a huge part. And not just those, those, uh, those small individual communities, but if we look at communities outside the U.S., it's even more so. Um, I know a girl that is uh, from the Ukraine, and that's a huge part. Like they don't go to the doctors very often. Mm -hmm. They create their own medicines and they do things like preventatively as well. Mm -hmm. They have, they have uh, folklore med medicines that basically are preventative things like a Absolutely. lot of like elixirs and syrups and mm -hmm. tinctures that they do to, Oh, it's coming up to cold and flu season these are the tinctures that we take, or these are the syrups that we use and we make, um, they don't reach for, you Advil. know, the, the Advil <laughs> or the day quill, or quill or right. <laughs> right. They just don't, it's just not part of their culture, right. but we're so inundated mm -hmm. that we don't know how to do that anymore. I think we've lost a lot of that. Oh no, we're learning. I'm bringing well, it back. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. But <laughs> We lost a lot of it. We're trying to bring that back yes, now. Definitely. Thankfully, the knowledge is not lost. It has been carefully preserved by uh, by actually pagans and Wiccans and right. uh, earth people for a very long time. Uh, so we're very fortunate. And pharmacology itself uh, has a, a huge compendium of just herbals because that's where they're concentrating those medicines from. Right. I do think it's interesting to note that herbalism and herbology works better if your body is healthy the, the healthier you are the better it works and you can't approach herbology like western medicine we're not going to just take an herb to lose weight or take one herb to uh you know fix something on the skin now you may be able to do that but what separates herbalism from western medicine um is that it's nutritive in a way that it's every day in your meals, this, that, and the other, your body is seeking homeostasis with these right. herbs and the herbs support yes. that homeostasis. So it's not like we're just using herbs to fix a symptom. They can be used that way. However, herbalism invites you uh, for a holistic approach to your health or the health of your dog or your cat right. or your bat or your rat. Um, so I think that's why uh, herbology is so shiny to a lot of people. They're, I mean, they really are trying to get back to basics and get back to health. They want to feel healthy again. And I think the majority of us really don't. Well, I think it's about balance. It's, uh, you know, we say disease and we mm -hmm. don't look at that word, which is dis-ease. So when you have a disease, it is bringing dis-ease into your body. It is an unbalancing mm -hmm. of of what we should be. So by bringing herbs in and taking them in, in a nutritive sense or in a uh, supplemental sense, because mm -hmm. we lose so much of the nutritive properties of our food that we think sustains us, but it's so highly processed mm -hmm. that um, we lose so much of that, that we need to take these in, in a different, in a different way so that um, we're able to help keep things in balance so that we are not in disease. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to supplement our diet with herbs and with nutritives like that because modern farming practices no longer produce vegetables with full nutrition profiles. Right. 
when we first came to this country, uh, when the, this country was colonized by Europeans, because a bunch of people have been here before that. However, when the colonists uh, from England, if you will, uh, came to the New World, which was America, United States, America, America is three continents. <laughs> but uh, but when they first came here, the leaf litter um, layer of nutrition was 12 feet thick 12 feet thick do you know what it is now same half inch yeah so all that nutrition uh that was in the that leaf litter was nutrifying basically all the plant matter all the trees all the bushes right. the herbs everything that grew there uh were in symbiosis uh and it had all that nutrition so it could self-sustain. Now our modern farming practices, we basically put three things in the soil to grow a plant, nitrogen, potassium, and what's the other one? Phosphorus. Phosphorus, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's it. So the bell pepper of today is not as nutritious as the bell pepper of the 1800s. No, and, and I have to honestly say, for those of you that have home gardens and you grow food for yourself, understand that if you're just straight up planting into your ground where you are mm -hmm. there's nothing to say that that ground it has additional nutritive properties mm -hmm. and so you really need to supplement your soil mm -hmm. with, with more than just the big three big three right absolutely which means using herbs in your life and grinding them up uh, and using them as teas and this, that, and the other, all of my spent herbs go back into the garden. Right. All of them, my potato bits, the stalks of the broccoli, like all those things attract microbes, which process the old vegetables and then die and provide more nutrition as well. Right. Like it's a whole system. So that's why people system. compost. Yes. Um, I, having things like chickens mm -hmm. um, makes a huge difference. The, the uh, chicken poop mm -hmm. is super high in nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And um, my, uh, my egg person that I get my eggs from, he's got a home. He has uh, livestock guardian dogs, goats and chickens, I believe. And I get my eggs from him, but he also gives me goat poop, yeah. which is amazing because goats eat everything, everything and process right. that nutrition right into their little pellets. Uh, and I've had some amazing, beautiful green growth uh, from those lovely pellets. Yeah, it's if you look at it, if you actually look at what you're doing, it is. And not to, you know, go off on a whole tangent, but it really, truly is that circle of life. Those plants mm -hmm. need those things from mm -hmm. other creatures, you know, and to be able to produce the food that we need with the nutritive effects, you know, that are um, positive to our, our body uh, needing to be able to process them in a specific way. Like when we eat broccoli, mm -hmm. our body does a specific thing where the, the saliva triggers enzymes to already start breaking down that in your mouth. It hasn't even hit the gut yet. That's why you have to chew really well. Yeah. Don't just chunk your food down like a dog. Right. They're meant to do that. We are not. <laughs> right. We are not. And and so there are plenty of other vegetables, herbs, things like that, that we eat that are meant to be macerated in your mouth, like chewed mm -hmm. on. And if you look at a lot mm -hmm. of indigenous cultures, a lot of them will literally chew on bundles of herbs mm -hmm. as a medicinal, um, uh, pan not a panacea, but as a medicinal way to um, help with symptoms of, of a mm -hmm. Or whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it is our, our bodies are designed to work with other things. I have a fun fact for you. We've talked about oh. <laughs> uh, we've talked about animals uh, self-medicating with herbs. Right. Now I'm going to let you in on a little fun fact. And most of us probably already know this, but there's a lot that don't. Uh, herbivores like elephants, giraffes, uh, anything that just we think exclusively eats you know, foliage, foliage. They actually will eat small animals 
occasionally. And they, it's because they need the phosphorus from the bones. Phosphorus doesn't right. naturally grow into a plant. You find it in bones. Uh, so I've seen with my eyes, elephants eat a chicken. I've seen squirrels uh, eat mice. I've seen uh, just, it's, it's, it shocks you at first. You're like, oh my gosh, is that just a, a, a freaky elephant that just did that? No, all of them do that. All of them do that. All of them. All of them do that. So um, I know vegans would like to think that um, eating meat is bad and eating plants is good only uh, for a morality reason. But there are um, scientific studies and empirical evidence that we all need to eat that energy. We all need to get those supplements, those minerals and nutrition from various sources. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you think about it, we're all beings that get our energy from the sun. However, we can't get it just from the sun by looking up and we get the nutrition. The sun's energy is converted by the body of the individual or the plant Right. And then something else consumes that plant or that body. But literally, we all eat the sun. We all eat the sun. And uh, that's how we're all connected through that. It, it, yeah. is, a, it is a circle that mm -hmm. is, um, is perpetuated no matter what the species is. Mm -hmm. Predators are necessary. Just right. like when they introduced wolves back into Yellowstone after eradicating them, they helped the actual ecology of Yellowstone. They built up the riverbanks just by them being there. It changed the behavior of the herbivorous animals that were that lived there, and everything went back into homeostasis the way it should be. Predators are important. Culling a, a, a herd is important. Uh, if they overgrow their area, they could be detrimental to not only humans but each other. They'll all starve to death. So uh, I understand the morality of veganism and vegetarianism. I understand that. However, in this particular terrarium that we live in, um, we all eat the sun in various ways. Um, we all, our, our bodies are meant to process it differently. That's why there are herbivores and carnivores and omnivores. Um, it's not just one thing. Uh, and I'm sure that you can survive off of just plants alone. Then you have to, uh, in order to just have that philosophy, those plants are living beings as well. Absolutely. They've, they've taken in the energy of the sun and are living their lives. And although they don't scream like they, uh, like we would think, you know, a human or an animal would when you're killing it or eating it or whatever, they have a chemical process that gives off an odor that tells uh, the plants around it, hey, we're being invaded, I'm being hurt, I'm being cut down, I'm being eaten. There are, they have, there is scientifically uh, backed studies that have shown trees talk to each other in the forest. Uh, so just saying, oh, it's bad to eat meat and kill animals and only eat plants. Well, plants, in my opinion, have a plant sentience. Right. Uh, and they're just as aware in their own way of this world as we are in our way. Um, I think that's why getting away from community and getting away from hunting our own food has been very detrimental for us. We used to give thanks to the ox before he yeah. fed us. We used to give thanks to the buffalo for providing his skin and bones and meat so that our tribe could survive. We used to thank the food, thank, thank the food itself, thank the universe or the God for f the food that is on our table. That changes everything. If you're just smashing a bunch of cows in a feedlot and slaughtering them like a factory, you know, as they do. Right. Yeah, I can see that method is very violent and very horrible. And the cows really don't have the best life. Now, when you eat another life, whether it be a plant or an animal, you're ingesting their energy. Oh, absolutely. I would much rather eat a cow that has been kept on a farm eating grass the way it's supposed to. Cows are not meant to eat grain. No. They're not meant to eat grain. They are meant to eat grasses. Uh, and they may get a seed from that grass every once in a while. However, that grass is for, that's what they're made to eat. Uh, so if I have a cow over here that's just uh, on, on grass fed and is loved its entire life uh, until it comes time for slaughter it. And then you give thanks 
to the cow by giving its life up to then sustain us. That's the way to do it. I will not eat chicken that I don't know where it comes from. I won't eat eggs that I don't know where they come from. Uh, Animal Husbandry Today has devolved into a stinky, horrible, terrifying mess. I, If you're going to eat a food, make sure that food, while it was alive, lived a beautiful life. Because then you're going to eat that beautiful energy. But if it's tortured and maimed and has its beak and feet cut off so it won't fight with the birds that they're squished with, I'm not going to eat that. Why would you want to eat that fear and pain and adrenaline? There's a lot of things that are wrong uh, with society today. But I think we could start on the little stuff. Animal husbandry probably has to change. Feed animal husbandry has to change um, to make it not only more sustainable... And the, for those that don't eat meat, think about, you know, the that we say, oh, it's plant-based, it's plant-based. But really, is it really, it is so highly processed. Mm-hmm. And what are those big processing plants putting out into our, uh, you know, our ecological universe here mm-hmm. um, to make these impossible burgers or, you know, the mm-hmm. fake meat and all that kind of stuff. What are they processed with? Right. What formaldehyde has washed it's what pro- herb to strip it of something of so that they everything. can use it in a burger. And then it's all spiced up and flavored with, right. Uh, with Does whatever. It actually tastes like meat. You're better off eating a grass fed burger yes. is better for you than that patty yeah. of who knows what pea protein. Mm -hmm. I agree. No, I I mean, and I'm, I am, I'm a pescatarian. I eat fish. I only eat wild caught. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm extremely fanatical about what I put into my body. But Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, is that sometimes it's, it's hard because we don't have resources to get to those things and they're more expensive, Mm -hmm. but food is medicine. Mm Mm-hmm. And when we start to when we start to break that down and understand that food has a medicinal usage for our body, as much as it provides pleasure, and I am a pleasure eater, I like to eat for pleasure. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to understand that we should be putting the majority of what we're putting into our body should be good for our body. Mm-hmm. It needs to be fuel. It needs to be minimally processed and it and needs nutritive. To, yeah, <laughs> very nutritive. And it needs to be as close to what it once was and what it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Because when we start to just mass produce things, it loses all value. It's like our grains are not even what they used to be, our breads, all that stuff. So it's that's why folklore and herbology, I believe, are usually centered around food and spirituality and community. It's usually somebody on the outskirts, the witch, you know, the, 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 the person in the woods who's on the outskirts of that microcosm of, of, uh, of mm-hmm. community mm-hmm. who's trying to get back at them for banishing and they make up or you know what I mean and it's it's done in that way to teach lessons about um what happens when we push people out of community who may be a little different or think a little different or you know so there's value in that folklore and those parables and those Mm -hmm. stories um, as much value as it is in understanding and knowing that you have to have a, animals do it naturally, seek out that nutritive um, quality and value. And, and that's a whole nother show is to talk about the pet food industry. Mm-hmm. If ours is terrible, theirs is a hundred times worse. Yeah, they don't care. Uh, they diseased animals from feedlots, all kinds of crap, oh, sawdust, no. whatever. Throw it in there. Throw yeah. it in there. Uh, and we're talking top brands, yeah. you know, because they don't know what to do with this this curf, this right. extra from all Less the other door. industries they're involved in. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It is. It really is. So I, I really believe that 
when we step away from those kind of things, from the folklore, from the, getting that information back into our lives. I was just watching on TikTok these ladies, these, uh, I think they're Mennonite, uh, doing all their canning and prepping, which I know Michelle is a huge fan of. I just didn't ever grow up with that. I grew up around it because my parents, we moved a lot. We moved in and out of small towns up upstate Pennsylvania and New Jersey, New York, that kind of stuff. And it was around me and I saw it, but it was not a core part of what who my parents were and my family life. Your family so, culture. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. totally not our culture. But I, I find it fascinating on how they do this to preserve that stuff. And if there is ever anything that goes wrong, those are not the people that were fighting in Costco over packages, you know, of food. Those people are like, oh, we're good. We're good. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. I think as we get more and more uh, reawakening, uh, I guess if we get reawakened to the possibility that, Herbs are important. I know it has for me. My herb journey has lasted a long time and the culmination is the apothecary. Um, But as I am learning more and more about treating myself with herbs, treating dogs topically with herbs, um, it really makes you think about what you're putting in your body. It really makes you rethink what food even is. Should it be for pleasure or have we made it that way? It should sustain us. So that we can do other things and live our life in a healthy way. So while it is pleasurable because we don't want to die and we're hungry, so it takes away our, our hunger pangs, um, it really shouldn't be for pleasure. All these gastronomical delights you see of these people for, you know, $500 a plate and you get right. like a little, a little, you know, what do wafer you call it? With a yeah, a wafer with, with a thing on or whatever. Yeah. They've taken it beyond you know, that is for pleasure. That is for tasting. That is for all those things. Uh, but just eating in general, um, I'm changing completely the way that I look at food, the way that I ingest it. Um, you know, uh, Melissa knows, Melissa and I both have a, a, a food journey. <laughs> we have uh, issues with food. Uh, so in learning more about myself, especially in my older years, um, I'm, I'm being very kind to myself and gently making changes um, so that they're long lasting, so that they are healthier, so that they make me feel better in, in this part of my life. So I think that herbology is the coming trend, is the coming wave. And as we get more and more practitioners, more and more people who are using herbs and oils, uh, I think that there is a hunger of uh for the young people that are coming up. Oh, absolutely. Wanting the answer. When you can't get into the doctor and uh, for six months, you need something. You need something. Uh-huh. You need a poultice. You need a tincture. You need something. Uh, more and more people are now available uh, to provide those services. So I am super, super happy. The trend is going in a correct and healthy way. I, I feel uh, more and more people are becoming uh, herbologists or at least having some tinctures and herbs in their little garden. Uh, and I think that's going to grow. I think that's going to, no pun intended. I think that's going to make everybody, <laughs> everybody feel better. Uh, oh, I, so I, I think that it's a huge part of, of uh, this trend that we're seeing even in our own grooming community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. We're starting to demand uh, better ingredient decks, mm-hmm. uh, more transparency in what is in the formulas. You know, we don't want all the chemicals. However, we all know everything's a chemical, everything's a thing, um, but we can choose judiciously to get back to nature. I think that's why I formed the apothecary service was because when you have something from a manufacturer, even if they're a good manufacturer, no one's knocking anybody, um, the ingredients are still not as fresh as when they went into the formula. Uh, and I think custom formulation uh, is a little niche uh, that I can fill. And I think a lot of people are looking for something like that. My herbs are fresh. They're right. absolutely fresh. Uh, I can vouch for that. Fresh. <laughs> yeah, <she knows. laughs> I have everything been there is- and seen the freshness of the herbs. <laughs> <laughs> so everything is fresh. Everything is organic, which simply means no, no pesticides have been used in the growth right. of that plant or around it. 
Um, and it's fresh. So all the properties are still intact. It's not been processed to death. It's not been heated. It's not been any of those things. And you'll get your package in all these little bottles that you then add to the shampoo or the conditioner or mix to the clay. Uh, and that way you have the freshest ingredients, the freshest regimen to do the most good uh, for your dog or cat or bat or giraffe or whatever. So. I think that it is a wave of the future that we have groomers that want to explore healthier ways to groom. I agree. I agree. All right. We're, we're at a little bit over our hour. Um, do you have anything to add? Do you have any call outs you want to give? Uh, no, I think that I'm good. I just, I, I just love the fact that, um, we are gaining, uh, viewership, listenership uh, with every podcast. Please share these with your grooming friends and, and, uh, and pet loving family uh, and just help us get the word out there that um, we're kind of talking about something that's very different and not really out there in our industry right now. Yeah, that's so true. It's not the same. Uh, it's very, uh, we're very cutting edge. <laughs> rebels are we yes we are well then we'll do our little our little spooky all right so as we lead out of our podcast yes. we love you so much uh, we love our viewership out there. If you're listening, um, yes, thank you. try to catch a video uh, of some of the podcasts. You can find that on YouTube. Uh, we have the full video as well as the audio available as the podcast itself. And may your next sip be just as divine and as herbal as the last. Absolutely.